John chapter 14, verse 16, 17, and 18. Um, it says, I will pray the Father that he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth me not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Let us pray again. Jesus, I'm ready. I've done my part. I'm humanly prepared. But that's nothing without the help of your Holy Spirit. So I pray that right now you may possess me. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and connect me to yourself. Forgive my sins and hide me behind the cross. May I be a blessing to your people. This is my prayer in your name. Amen. All right, this is my second last part of my series, which I started in November. Um, does anybody remember the title? Do you remember the, the series I'm doing? <laughs> who am I? No, just who? All right, that, that's not very far from, you're not far, not far from the kingdom. Uh, yes, we talked about just who is God, just who is Satan, just who is Jesus today. We are saying just who is the Holy Spirit. And the next time um, we preach, uh, I will be saying, just who are we? All right. It's a very short series. And um, as a preacher, by definition, I'm a Bible student. And, and um, one thing I've learned a long time ago is that humility is strength. I don't want to pretend that I know everything when I preach. And I know that um, it's very easy for preachers to, to philosophize and to theorize and to speculate and, 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 and pretend that they know everything about everything about God. And that's not how I want to be. My approach is uh, based on the uh, book Deuteronomy 20, 29.29. It says the secret things belong to God. But the things which are revealed belong to us and our children. My approach is simple. I stick with the revealed things. If it is not revealed, then I don't pretend to know it. If it's not in the Bible, then I don't know it. It's just a simple approach. And I think that's particularly very important when you think about, uh, when you approach uh, the subject of the Holy Spirit. Because there are so many things we don't know about the Holy Spirit. And, and, and I, I think every time we are to preach on the Holy Spirit, every time we are to teach about the Holy Spirit, we should tread softly, not pretend we know everything. And, 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 um, but I know enough. I know enough not to say or to, to have a title uh, of my sermon uh, that is, What is the Holy Spirit? The title of my sermon is, Who? Not what is the Holy Spirit? Because there's a reason. That is also, that is because that part of the um, Holy Spirit is revealed. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, it says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. And, 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 and I'm saying uh, the Holy Spirit is a living being because he can be grieved. Because uh, non-living things cannot grieve. The Bible says that do not grieve him. Even smart robots cannot grieve. They don't have emotions. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit has emotions. He can be grieved. He can be hurt. He can be disappointed. I also think he can also, he has an ability to love and he can be pleased. He can be happy. So do not grieve him. Tells us right there that he is a living being. 
But also, I want to tell you that the Holy Spirit is not just a living being. He is the living God. He is not just a living being. He is the living God. And I want us to read a verse for that. I want us to quickly go to Acts chapter 5. What book? Acts chapter 5. And I want us to read verse 3 and verse 4. Verse 3 and verse 4. It says, But Peter said to Ananias, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Why did you lie to the Holy Spirit? This is Peter's question. Why did you lie to the Holy Spirit? And verse 4 says that, While it remained unsold, he did not, be, did not rem remain your own? After it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. So Peter says that, why did you lie to the Holy Spirit? And he says that when you lie to the Holy Spirit, you lie to God. The Holy Spirit is God. All right. If you lie to him, then you are lying to God. Actually, it's even impossible to lie to God. Maybe you try to lie to God, which is you're lying to yourself. All right. Um, why did you lie to the Holy Spirit? And why did you lie to God? The Holy Spirit is not just a living being. He is the living God. I want to take it slowly today. Um, I feel like just relaxing. Usually, I'm too excited when I preach. You know that I want to just take it easy. So the Holy Spirit is not just a living being, but he is the living God. Today, I want us to approach him and study about him as a gift from God. The scripture reading we just read today says that Jesus says in, in, uh, in, in, Matthew, uh, so in John 14, he says that I will ask the Father that he may send you the Holy Spirit, or he says another comforter. He says, I will ask the Father and he will send you another comforter. And I want to pause there and look at the word another. Because in, in the Greek word, the word another there is not, uh, it's another of the same sort, not another of a different nature. It's the same thing, another of the same thing. In other words, the Holy Spirit is the continuation of what Jesus has started. Meaning, when he comes, he's going to come and introduce something Jesus did not introduce. Whatever he teaches you, will always be in harmony with what Jesus has taught. They are not in conflict. They are, he is another of the same sort. That's what the Bible says. Holy Spirit is another, another comforter. Now, the King James Version says that he is another comforter, and that's all right. He's another comforter. That's all right. But my, 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 my challenge with that uh, 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 title given to him is that it limits the Holy Spirit only to the comforting part. It's like the Holy Spirit is only there to comfort us. And the role of the Holy Spirit is much bigger than that. In fact, the Greek word for uh, the comforter that is used here is parakletos, is the word that is used there. Parakletos, another parakletos. And the meaning of parakletos is one who stand by your side. One who stands by your side. In fact, uh, it is also used for the word advocate. All right, that's what uh, John in the whole Bible is the only one who uses the word parakletos. All right, he uses it only when he talks about the Holy Spirit. He also uses it when he talks about Jesus. He says that uh, in John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, he says that, um, little children, I write these things to you that you may not sin, but if anyone sins, we have another paracletos. We have another advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So the Holy Spirit and, and, and Jesus Christ, are, are, according to the Greek, are, Jesus Christ is, the, is our advocate, the one who stands by our side. Now the Bible says that we have an advocate in Jesus Christ in heaven. We have an advocate who stands with us, who stands by our side, and who stands uh, with us. Now, the beautiful thing is that we have an advocate in heaven, Jesus Christ, the righteous man. All right, 
but also we have an advocate on earth. Jesus Christ said, I will ask the Father to send you another, another, another advocate, another one to stand with you, to stand by you, and to stand uh, um, on your side, to be with you. But the, 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 the closest interpretation of uh, the trans uh, translation of the word parakletos is the simple word uh, we use in other versions. The Bible said, other version says that, I will ask the Father and he will send you another helper, not the comforter. And I said, the word comforting, uh, the word comfort, it limits his role to only comforting. But the Bible says that, I will send, I will ask the Father and he will send you another helper. In other words, uh, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he will come and be your personal coach. That's what the Bible says. He is your personal helper. All right. Jesus Christ had uh, all the disciples. He could not attend to them one by one. There were so many. He was one. But the Bible says that I will send you another helper. I will send you a personal coach. And I want to assure you that uh, the Holy Spirit is our coach. And, and, and the Bible says that in, in, um, in John chapter 14, verse 26, it says that when he comes, the Holy Spirit, he will teach you all things. In, 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 in John chapter 16, verse 13, he says, when he comes, he will lead you into all truth. That's what the coach does. He teaches you and he also leads you. He guides you into all truth. That's what the Bible tells us. So the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is your personal coach. And, and I'm saying to you, he is not just a coach who, who tells you what to do and, and then, then just watches you as you struggle on your own. He's so hands-on. He's very hands-on. He's, like he's, like he's like a mother who is teaching a, a, a baby how to walk. All right. They, they, she holds her, him by the hand. All right. And stand on, on, by his side and, and help and cheer him on. The Holy Spirit is not just a coach who tells you what to do, but he also gives you strength to do what he tells you uh, to do. Also, as you struggle, as you, as, you, as you get better, as you becoming a better Christian, the Holy Spirit is there with you, whispering to your ear um, words of encouragement. He tells you that you are loved in heaven. He tells you that the Father loved you so much, he gave his only begotten son, so that you may not perish, but have eternal life. Not only that, he tells you that Jesus Christ has paid the full price for your redemption with the gold of his blood and the silver of his tears. He does not only tell you that when you are discouraged, when you don't think you can make it to the kingdom, the Holy Spirit tells you that you can make it, you can do it. Jesus Christ has overcome the world and he did it on your behalf. Victory is already war, has already been won on your behalf. And you can overcome your personal struggles, your personal challenges in Jesus' name. When, when you doubt your prayers, when you think praying is an exercise in futility, it's a waste of time, when you feel like it's not working to pray, the Holy Spirit will remind you that there is a sanctuary in heaven and you have Jesus Christ up there as your priest. And he is not just a priest. He is a priest who is able to sympathize with your weaknesses, who has been tempted in all points, just as you are. He knows what you're going through and he will provide and grant you grace when you need grace. The Holy Spirit does not only tell you that Jesus Christ is there for you as a high priest. And, and so, so sometimes when you are a servant of God serving and you feel you are not appreciated, when you feel like nobody is paying attention to you, the Holy Spirit tells you, um, um, he, he refers you to Revelation chapter 22, 12. Behold, I come quickly. My reward is with him, with me, and I will give each man according to his work. That's what the Bible says. He encourages you. And when you look around, you see all these uh, wars and rumors of wars, all these conflicts, the famines, the pestilences, all these problems that are there in the world. When you think that evil is becoming, uh, evil is winning, and, and you, you doubt the future of uh, us as a, as a species, the Bible tells you that Jesus Christ reminds the Holy Spirit reminds you that uh, in, 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 uh, in Isaiah chapter 50, verse 3 and 4, the Bible says that our God shall come. 
our God shall come and shall not be silent. And before him, fire devours. And he will come and avenge all of us and avenge his children. He will come and judge. That's what the Bible says. So the Holy Spirit, friends, is not just a personal coach. And I'm saying he is not a, a coach who's aloof, who stands and just waits and watches you struggle. He's very hands-on. Now, his job is to first to lead you into the truth, but not only that, he gives you strength and, and, and makes sure that you continue in the truth. He gives you sustenance. He gives you power. He gives you this staying power in the truth. And, and also, he, he prepares you for a citizenship in heaven. Now, that is the most beautiful thing. Now, do you remember the verse in John chapter 14? Uh, verse 1 to 3? Can, 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 can you recite it? Do you know the verse? 1, 2, 3. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. And it says, in my father's house are many mansions. Now, I want to pause right there. It says, in my father's house are many mansions. There are mansions up there waiting for you. In my father's house are many mansions. They are already there. They are already there. But now the confusing part is when Jesus Christ says, I go and prepare a place for you. He says the place is already there. The mansions are there. But then I am going up there to prepare a place for you. Is Jesus Christ up in heaven building mansions? He's not building mansions. They are already there. They are already there. But Jesus Christ, friends, listen to me. Jesus Christ is not building mansions up in glory. He is building characters for the mansions in glory. He is building characters to fit heaven. All right. And he does that uh, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The process is called sanctification. That's what he does. He is building characters for eternity. Because mansions are there already waiting for you. Mansions are in heaven already waiting for you. Now, um, Jesus Christ, in, in this scripture we just read, he says, um, um, when he talks about the Holy Spirit, he says, I will ask the Father and he will send you another comforter. And he says, that is the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth. And he's not the spirit of deception, the spirit of of truth. And I want to pause right there. And last time we talked about we talked about the truth. Some people don't believe there is uh, absolute truth. We talked about that the last time. But there is truth, and the truth is Jesus Christ. We talked about that the last time. All right. So Jesus Christ says the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. Now listen to this. That's not only that. The Bible in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, it says that um, uh, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of grace and supplication. Uh, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, it says that um, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of wisdom and understanding. It says the Holy Spirit is the spirit of um, strength and counsel. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Uh, if you read uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 4, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of grace. Uh, if you read um, um, Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, it says the Holy Spirit is the spirit of prophecy. That's what the Bible says. It's the spirit of uh, holiness. That's what uh, Zechariah says. It's the spirit of holiness. And what, 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 the one I like is, uh, is uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 15. It says that uh, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of adoption, meaning that's how we get to become sons and daughters of God because of the spirit of adoption. That's what the spirit is, the spirit of adoption. Not only that, Jesus Christ says that when the spirit comes, he will testify of me. That is uh, John 15, 26. When he comes, he will testify of me. He's going to talk about Jesus Christ. He's going to talk to him about him as, uh, as king of kings and, and the darling of heaven. He's going to talk to you about uh, uh, Jesus Christ as the creator. 
He's going to talk about Jesus Christ as the baby in a manger, on the manger. He's going to talk about Jesus Christ as your Savior. He's going to point you to Calvary. That's what the, the Spirit will do. He's going to testify of Jesus Christ. He's not going to just testify. He's going to lift him up. Now, I want to move on and, and read a verse for you, which we, we already know. As I, as I move on, we, we know this verse. Uh, John chapter 16, verse 8. John chapter 16, verse 8. It says, when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. When the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of sin. Now, now we like him. I just said it. We like to hear him uh, that the Holy Spirit is the comforter. All right. But... He is not going to comfort you in your sins. The Holy Spirit is not going to comfort you in sin. In fact, the Holy Spirit is going to make you very uncomfortable in your sins. He's not going to comfort you in sin. He's going to convict you of sin. And, 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 and I, I'm saying this because people really like to hear good things. They, they want to hear how uh, awesome they are, how wonderful they are. That's why if you go to uh, these mega churches where uh, these televangelists, they fill stadiums with thousands of people they come to hear. All they hear is that they are wonderful. They are good people. And they are told to find some inner beauty, some inner goodness. All right, find some, some giant, awaken some giant in you. All right, that's what you're told. You are wonderful. All right, but the spirit, when he comes, he will convict the world of sin. He's going to make you uncomfortable in sin. He's not going to just make, he's going to talk, preach smooth things. That means a preacher, a preacher who has the Holy Spirit is not going to always say nice things to you. A preacher who has the Holy Spirit is not going to always say smooth things. All right. Uh, sometimes he's going to make you uncomfortable because he's got the Spirit. The spirit is to convict you of sin. The problem with us people is that we want to have a connection with God, but we don't want the correction that comes with it. All right, we want to have him as a companion, but we reject his op opinions. All right, the problem is that we have foolishly deceived ourselves into believing that the role and the job of the Holy Spirit is to warm our hearts, not warn us from sin. The Holy Spirit is not to warm your heart. That's not his job. He's to warn you away from sin. He's going to convict you of sin. That's what the Bible says. All right. And, 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 and now the question is, who has the Holy Spirit? Or who can have the Holy Spirit? Because I've heard, I've heard people uh, saying to me, uh, a friend of mine was saying, if you cannot speak in tongues, then, then you don't have the Holy Spirit. I'm sure there are, many, there are many things people say. You know, if you cannot do this, then that is a sign you don't have the Holy Spirit. Who has the Holy Spirit? And I want us to quickly go to the book of Acts. I want us to go to Acts chapter 5, and I want us to quickly read verse 32. I do feel hot. Am I the only one? I feel very, very hot. I know I'm preaching, but is that okay? I'm sure it is. I'm sure it's, it's very okay. Acts chapter 5, verse 32. And we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey. The Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey. So the Holy Spirit is given to those who obey. 
or, or those who are willing to obey. Not those who speak unintelligible uh, uh, in tongues nobody understands. All right, those who, who speak things nobody knows. You know, tongues. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit is given to those who obey, not those who are rolling and rollicking on the floor. The Holy Spirit is given to those who obey. No, do you guys know this uh, foolishness? Do you know what the holy, holy laughter is? That's what they call it. There's, there's foolishness on YouTube. I almost showed you a video, but I thought it was too much. Um, there's, there's, there's some foolishness. They call it the holy laughter. When, when, uh, they say when you have the Holy Spirit, some, this, some of these churches, when you go there, um, they, they, the preacher would start saying something. And then suddenly we just start laughing. And the whole congregation will just laugh like for like 20 minutes. And no, no, non-stop, people are just, they just fall on the floor. They do nothing but laugh. It's called holy laughter. The Holy Spirit is given to them who obey. And the Holy Spirit is not the author of confusion. The Holy Spirit is given to them who obey. But also, it is not given to those pastors, so-called, who pray on the gullibility of people and, 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 and be asking for money to buy some private jets and mansions and cars. A, a few months ago, there's a fool called Kefta Dollar. Um, he made news like a few months ago. He, he wanted uh, his congregation and other people to buy him a 70 million, uh, 65 thousand dollar uh, a million um, private jet last week I was listening to two fools talking and, 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 and one was saying to the other imagine you know the Holy Spirit tells us that we, we cannot fly in these commercial airlines because there are so many demons out there we can we we not allow the Holy Spirit does not allow us to to fly in in these jets and in private in planes that everybody's flying the Holy Spirit is given to them who obey. And when you think about it, when you think about the fact that, you know, all these, all, all these people who, who are, I said, praying on the uh, vulnerability and gullibility of people, think about Jesus Christ who never, who never owned a donkey. Jesus Christ never owned a donkey, and that one day Jesus Christ had to ride on a donkey. He had to go, and he had to send his disciples and to borrow somebody else's donkey. Jesus Christ had no donkey. No, he did not have it. He didn't own a donkey. He had to ask somebody, please, may I use your donkey? All right, he did not have a mansion. Jesus Christ did not even have a house. When his disciples came to him and they were saying, Lord, where do you live? Where do you stay? He says, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests. But the son of man has no place to lay his head. He had no mansion. He had no donkey. The Holy Spirit, though, he was full of the Holy Spirit. In fact, when he was born, when Jesus Christ was born, the Holy Spirit had to overshadow his mother's womb. He was full of the Holy Spirit right from the womb. From the womb to the grave, Jesus Christ was full of the Holy Spirit. He never asked for private jets. All right, the Holy Spirit is given to those who obey. The Holy Spirit is given to those who obey. Now, the other thing I want to mention, the other thing I want to mention, friends, as I talk about the Holy Spirit, it is impossible for me to be talking to you about the Holy Spirit and, and, and not mention Pentecost. Jesus Christ, after his resurrection, he talked to his disciples and he gives them this, what uh, we call uh, the Great Commission. He says, um, go ye um, to all the nations and teach them and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost and teaching them to observe all the things whatsoever I have commanded you. All right, now, now, uh, before that, be, before they went out to, to conquer, Jesus Christ gave, gave them a mandate, mandate to go and conquer the world in his name. 
From its inception, the gospel was a global mission. It was not to be kept in a small corner or in a small village or in a, in a small city. The gospel was global. It was a global mission from its beginning. So Jesus Christ told his disciples to go and conquer the world in his name. But he says, but stay and wait. Do not leave Jerusalem until, wait in Jerusalem until you are filled with power from above. Until you are imbued with power from above. Do not leave. Don't go. Don't go when you don't have the Holy Spirit. And that, that is to me, friends, a difference between a sermon and a good speech. A difference between a sermon and a good speech is that when it is a sermon, not a good speech, it is not a human-to-human -human encounter. It is not the preacher relating to the audience. There is somebody called the Holy Spirit in between us who is applying the messages I am preaching to your heart. It is not just a good speech. The Holy Spirit is between us. All right. That's the difference between um, um, a sermon and a good speech. Now, the other thing is that the Bible says that as they were in the upper room praying, the Bible says that suddenly a sound of a mighty rushing wind from heaven came and filled the house uh, where they stayed. The Bible says that suddenly there were as of tongues of fire. They were distributed among the disciples. Now, I want you to know this. It was tongues of fire, not eyes of fire. There were tongues of fire, not eyes or noses of fire. These were tongues of fire because they signified the proclamation of the gospel. And the fire there was the power that was to accompany the preaching of the gospel. So, right there, when the Holy Spirit was given, there was to be a powerful proclamation of the gospel. You know what happened that day? Peter stood up. And the Bible says when he spoke, the people were pricked in their hearts and they asked, what should we do? What, can, what shall we do? And the Bible says that that one day, 3,000 souls were added to the faith. Now, this is one Peter, one preacher. Do you know what happened when John and other disciples went out? It was 3,000 for Peter. It was, in fact, if you read uh, John chapter 4, verse 4, it says John and Peter, when they went preaching, it was now 5,000 people. All right. And now, uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 47 Acts chapter 2, verse 47, it says that they were daily added every day. There were new people to come to the church. And, and if you think it was maybe one people or one person or two people, no. Uh, uh, Acts chapter 5, verse 14, it says that um, multitudes were added daily. Multitudes were added daily. This was Pentecost. All right. And, and, and um, Acts chapter 1, verse 5, Jesus Christ said, you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You know what? Baptize, uh, baptize means? It means you are immersed in the Holy Spirit. You are full of it. You are baptized in the Holy Spirit. That's what happened in Pentecost. They were baptized and thousands of souls were added. Now, I'm mentioning this because that was the beginning of Christianity, of the church. And the Bible, the Bible, when it talks about the spirit, it uses the metaphor of rain. Rain. Hosea chapter 6, verse 3. He shall come to us as rain, as the latter rain and the former rain. Hosea chapter 6, verse uh, God is going to come to us as rain. Rain. How fitting. Because when the Spirit comes, it always brings revival and reformation. It brings rain. Now, uh, that, friends, at Pentecost was the early rain or the former rain. There is the latter rain 
and the former rain. My point is, it's going to happen again. It's coming. Very soon, we will see this great spiritual uh, revolution. God is ready to turn the world upside down. You know the, 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 the song, there shall be showers of blessings? There shall be showers of blessings. This is the promise of love. That's what the song says. There shall, there shall be seasons refreshing, sent from the Savior above. And it says, showers of blessings, showers of, showers of blessings we need. Now, the, the part, it says that uh, mercy drop round, round us are falling. But for the showers we plead. Yes, we have to plead. We have to plead for the Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible says in Zechariah chapter 10 verse 1. Zechariah chapter 10 verse 1, it says that um, ask of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. Ask for it. Ask for rain. Ask for the Holy Spirit. And we are used to praying for some personal things. We, we pray for health. We pray for jobs. We pray for money. We pray for success. We, we pray for families. We pray for all these things. The Bible says that pray for rain. Pray for the Holy Spirit. It's coming. Pray. Pray, God is ready to shower us with rain. I've been praying this for this for, for, for years. There was a year, I think four years ago, I used to get up every morning and read about the Holy Spirit and pray for the Holy Spirit upon his people. Pray for the Holy Spirit on me. Pray for the Holy Spirit on the church. Pray. And, and this is the Bible. This, was, this is the promise um, Joel chapter 2 verse 28 it says after those things after uh, those days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh did I say all flesh I will pour out my spirit on all flesh it says your sons and, da and your daughters will prophesy your old men will dream will see, uh, will see will dream dreams and your young men will see visions I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Sons and daughters will prophesy. It's coming. It's coming. And we have to pray for it. Don't just, don't, don't just pray for your, for your success, for, for, for money, for, for all these things. Pray for rain. This is the kind of rain you don't need uh, an umbrella for you. You want it to just soak you wet. You want it. You need it. Pray. Now, the other thing I want to mention um, is I, in the beginning, I mentioned um, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. And it says, the Bible, the Bible says that, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. It says, the, the last part says, by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Do you get that one? The Holy Spirit is, do, is the one who does the sealing. Well, what is the sealing? What is, what is sealing? What, what does it mean to be sealed? Uh, if you read um, the SCA Bible Commentary, Volume 4, page 1161, it says the sealing is the settling into the truth, settling into the truth, both spiritually and intellectually. It's when you're settled, you, you know what you believe, and you, you don't see a point of uh, discussing evolution. There's no need. You are sealed. You don't waste your time talking and discussing homosexuality in the church. There's no point. You know what you believe. You, you, know, you, you know what the Bible says. We're not divided by uh, women's ordination. We, we, don't, we, we know what we believe. We are settled both intellectually. We are convinced and convicted. And spiritually, we are living the truth. We're not looking to the left or to the right. We know what we believe. We are sealed. So when we are sealed, we will be united. Right? We, we, we won't be you know, fighting about you know, mundane things. We won't be discuss We'll be talking about the mission. Yeah. We'll be living right and, and, and uh, we will be living a healthy lifestyle. We'll be speaking right. 
We are sealed. We are ready for translation. We are ready for glory. That's what sealing is. Now, I have two things before I close. Two things before I close. A few weeks ago, there was, there was a young man who I talked to. He came and visited this church. He, he told me the saddest thing I've ever heard. That was the first experience I've had. I've never heard this. Young man came here, and he, he was talking about marriage. And he said, um, she, she doesn't want to get married. And he said, um, especially with a Christian woman. He says, because he knows that he is not going to heaven. He knows that he is not going to heaven. Because he thinks he has committed the unpardonable sin. He is so convinced. He says, I know God has rejected me. That was the saddest thing I've ever heard. I've never heard somebody talk like that. Never heard somebody say, I have no share among God's people. I have no share in his kingdom. And what was even unfortunate is that when we started talking, other people just came, the conversation was aborted, we could not continue, and he had to leave. And I thought about it. That was the saddest thing. Now, I have two things I want to say before I close. First, I want to address the unpardonable sin. What is the unpardonable sin? Sin that God cannot forgive. All right. And, and then I'm going to say something else after that. I want us to quickly go to um, Matthew chapter 12. I want us to read verse 31 and 32. Chapter 12. I should read it from the King James. I like it in the King James. Um, Matthew chapter 12. Verse 31 and 32. Wherefore, I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, shall not be forgiven unto men. But whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaketh against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven uh, him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Now, I want you to follow me carefully. Um, today I told you I feel like teaching. I want to just take it easy. <laughs> I want you to follow me carefully. The Bible says that all manner of sin shall be forgiven. A few years ago, I was doing a Bible study in Busan with a young man who said to me, um, can, does God, can God forgive any sin? I said, yes, absolutely. He said, can he forgive Hitler? I'm like, yeah, sure. But he said, but, but he, he killed so many people. I'm like, yes, God for, can, can forgive him. And I told him that, you know, God is not us. You know, his ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts. Or right, God can forgive sin. Now, I want you, now I'm going to challenge you, do this for me. Do this for yourself. I want you to think of one sin, one sin. Think about the worst, the worst one you can think of. That cannot fit in all manner of sin. Think about one sin that you can, the worst thing you can think of that cannot fit in this phrase, all manner. Think of one sin. Think about it. Murder. Lying. It fits there. Lying. All manner. 
killing, murder, rape, stealing, adultery. All men of sin. Think about the sin. Think about one sin that does not fit there. And if you can, then that, that be, if you could be successful doing that, one sin you can think of that cannot fit in all manner. That is not, it, it's, it's different. One particular sin you can think of that cannot fit this description. All manner of sin. You know what it means? It means the unpardonable sin is not one particular sin. Because you cannot think of one particular sin that God can, cannot forgive. All manner of sin shall be forgiven. All manner. If you can think of one that cannot fit this, all manner, you'll be successful, then you prove me wrong. But there is no sin you can think of, I know. There is no sin you can think of that is not all manner. It does not fit there. There is no one particular sin you can think of. All manner of sin can be forgiven. God forgives sin. He does forgive. He does not condone it. He actually hates sin, but he forgives sin. All men of sin. But now, and I say to you, the unpardonable sin is not one particular sin. It is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. In fact, put in simple language, the blasphemy, um, the, 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 the unpardonable is when you have, uh, you make it a habit to, to, to reject the Holy Spirit, to push him away. You, you, you make it a habit. It's your life. It's, your, it's who you are. You keep, he, he keeps knocking. You keep rejecting. Sometimes it happens that you cross the line of no return. You cross that line. And there's no turning back. That's, that's what happens. It is not one sin. It is rejecting help. Because the Holy Spirit is the only hope we have for salvation. If we reject him, there's no hope. So, think about it. The Holy Spirit, uh, the, the unpardonable sin, is not one sin you can think of. It is what, and, and now, I want to pause right here, before I finish. I want to pause right here and say to you, and say to you, if, if, like this young man who came, if you can think, if, if, if somehow you feel like you have committed the unpardonable sin, that is proof that you haven't. If you think you have committed an, an unpardonable sin, that is proof to you that you actually haven't. The reason that, the fact that you're still guilty about it means you haven't crossed the line yet. The fact that you, you still worry about it, it means... You are still safe. You haven't crossed the line yet. And, and nobody would ever know when you have crossed that line. Even you yourself, you, you wouldn't know. The only man in the Bible we know that was rejected by God was Saul. He did not know. He was still expecting God to talk to him. He complained to Samuel one time. He did not know he was rejected. He lived his life. When you have been rejected by God, you wouldn't know. That's why you have to be careful. And also, nobody else would know. Nobody's going to come to you and say, Brother, the Holy Spirit has rejected you. Because nobody knows. You wouldn't know. And I repeat, the unpardonable sin is not one particular sin. Because all manner of sin shall be forgiven. It's when you reject Make it a habit to reject the Holy Spirit until there's nothing he can do for you. I'm going to close. I want to close. I want to, I want to close. I want to go and, and read. First, I want to mention to you that when we think about the Holy Spirit, we sometimes think about, um, we, we think about, um, the New Testament, we think it's, a, it's a, a discovery of the New Testament, an invention of the New Testament. The very first book of the Bible, the very first chapter of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, the second verse, 
If you start from verse 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And verse 2 says that, And the earth was formless. Please, I'm almost done. People, pay, pay attention. That, um, the earth was formless and void, and darkness was upon the surface of the deep. And the Holy Spirit was um, hovering. That's what another version says. The Holy Spirit covered um, the surface of the waters. Now, I want to pause right there. I was, I was, for the first time this week, I was reading this in depth. And, and I, I discovered the word um, cover. The Holy Spirit was covering the, face of the, uh, of the surface of the water. In, in Hebrew, in Hebrew uh, that, that word that is used there, it, it's... Um, when, um, when a bird is sitting on, on, on its egg to hatch them. All right. So it, it was like the Holy Spirit was intub intubating. All right. So the Holy Spirit was there, and God was about to organize this chaos into something beautiful. And the Holy Spirit was there um, drooping over um, this nothingness. All right. And God said, let there be light. Now, I want you to listen, please. I think about that verse all the time. Every time I think about it, I think about my life. Bef before God said to my life, to me, let there be light, my life was void. That's my life. Before I met Christ, it was formless. It was void. And it was covered with darkness. I lived in darkness. But all along, and I didn't know, the Holy Spirit was hovering over me. And I didn't know. I didn't know. I live my life. I don't care about God. I don't care. All right. I live my life the whole time. The Holy Spirit was drooping over me. He was, he was ready to, um, to create something. To, to, to create me anew. And I'm saying to you, as I close, as I close, there's somebody who's here in this church. Maybe you come every Sabbath. Maybe you've been, you know, an SGA for a long time. But you still don't have a relationship with God. And I'm saying to you, the Holy Spirit is hovering over you. The Holy Spirit is hovering over you. He is ready to create you anew. Holy Spirit is hovering over you. He's ready to make a difference in your life. He's ready to make you a better person. He's ready to give you a new heart. He's ready to change your heart. He's ready to make you a new creation. He's hovering over your life. And he's ready to say to you, let there be light. He's ready. So, is there any person today, I don't usually make appeals, is there any person today who does not have a relationship with God? Who wants to take a stand for Jesus Christ today and accept him. And I'm saying to you, the Holy Spirit is hovering over you right now. If you want, you want to play, if you just play, play a song, um, I Surrender. Is there anybody, it's a long summer, sometimes it has to be long. Is there anybody today who does not have that connection with Jesus Christ? Who wants to take a stand, accept him in your life as your savior? Because it'd be foolish of me to assume everybody's a Christian because they come to church. I'm not that foolish. You know your heart. I'm going to ask you to stand. If you, not everybody, if you want to accept Jesus Christ today in your life, I'm going to give you a chance to stand.
decide. Exactly. The Holy Spirit is ready to make a difference in your life. Stand and accept Jesus Christ. The Spirit is ready to create you anew. Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, God says, My spirit will not strive with men forever. My spirit will not plead with them. He's pleading with you right now. you. Jesus loves you. We are very grateful for you, Holy Spirit, as our personal coach, helping us to make it to the kingdom. Help us not to grieve you. Help us not to let you down. Help us to cooperate with you as you are um, doing your best to see to it that we make it. And whenever we are discouraged, Lord, we are very thankful for the reminders that you give us, that you love us so much. Um, the Father, he gave his son for us. I am very excited every time I think about the latter rain. And I pray that we may not only pray for our personal success. Let's pray for the success of the church, for the success of um, missionaries around the world. Pray for the leadership of this church. We pray that you may unite us, Lord, as we are nearing the second coming. The devil has sometimes been successful in dividing us with 
false doctrine and, and conflicts among us. But we pray for the Holy Spirit to come and bind us together. And we pray for this little church, Lord. We are getting bigger and bigger every Sabbath. And we depend on your Holy Spirit to go. Pray that you may help us to show the fruit of the Spirit. May we be more loving, more kind, more gentle and patient with each other. Also, Lord, I, I like to see us more joyful. We have to have joy. And fill us with the Holy Spirit and bless us today. In your name we pray. Amen.